Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Cockroach Labs, for having us here. Uh, we are uh, yeah, very happy to be there. Um, OK, so let me introduce ourselves and the company. So Dev Sisters is a, a Korean gaming company that was created about uh, 15 years ago. Uh, my name is Pierre. I'm working on the game server implementation. So we are the, the main users of uh, CockroachDB for storing var uh, our game data. And this is Cheng Wan. He is a DevOps engineer. He works on uh, deploying, uh, provisioning, monitoring uh, our CockroachDB cluster. Uh, so we are going to uh, first explain uh, how we use CockroachDB, like what are our usage patterns. Then we're going to uh, tell you some stories about uh, our launch, uh, the launch of our game that was a year and a half ago, and some problems that we had, uh, hoping that it might be useful for, for some of you, and then finish with some tips uh, and things we learned uh, along the way. So, uh, okay, so our game uh, is called Cooker and Kingdom. That's a multiplayer uh, social RPG where you can build your own, uh, your own city, your kingdom, uh, make an army of cookies and battle other players. Uh, because we, so we already had another game uh, that was pretty popular before, so just Cooker Run. Uh, it was pretty popular in Asia and in, in Korea. So we knew that from day one, we were uh, expecting a lot of users. So we had to prepare and scale everything so that we can uh, support uh, all that load. And there was actually, uh, I think we reached a million downloads uh, in the first 24 hours. So that was, that was really uh, uh, tough. Uh, OK, so um, let me talk about our data first. Uh, every time a user does something in the game client, a request is sent to the server. And then we validate the request and we modify uh, the user state. So basically, it can be receiving an item, spending some coins to do something, uh, constructing a building, uh, and so on. The user state is really large. It's like a, an object with hundreds of fields and deeply nested uh, other objects. So if we were to update that state at every request, uh, that would not be really performant because we would be saving like a huge uh, chunk of data every time. Um, and also we decided against splitting this data into multiple tables because there would be like too many tables. It would be um, very complex to maintain and to, to uh, evolve. So we went for event sourcing. So that means that uh, every time uh, something is changed, instead of saving the new state, we save an event that describes what changed. So for example, received uh, 10 coins. And when we want to load a user state, we just uh, start from an initial state and replay the, the diff, uh, all the events that happened. Uh, we also store snapshots once in a while just to avoid uh, replaying too many events. So every like 300 events, we save a snapshot. So a snapshot is just the whole user state. We start from the latest snapshot when we want to replay uh, to load the user state and replay only the events that happen after the, the snapshot. Uh, so at the end, our database schema is pretty simple. Um, we have mostly uh, two very important tables, one for all the events, one, one for all the snapshots. And uh, the data itself uh, is just binary uh, protobuf uh, data. OK, uh, in addition to that, we also have some use case where we want to display a list of all users. So for example, top 100 ranking in some uh, competition between the players. In this case, we don't want to load the user state of these uh, 100 users because that would be too slow. So um, we have another pattern where, uh, pattern where uh, from those events that we create, we have a background process that consumes them through Kafka and creates projections. So those are, um, this is data that's easy to access. We can query 100 users at the same time and uh, get their name, their profile picture, and so on. Uh, so at the end, uh, we have a small amount, but very large tables. Uh, there are billions of rows, especially in the events, events table, uh, for terabytes of data. Uh, but we don't have a lot of different patterns, so we can, we can optimize this, uh, these few tables uh, very deeply. Uh, our usage is very insert intensive, so we basically just insert uh, events and snapshots. 
Um, we don't have much contention. We do have transaction between different entities, like uh, things uh, between two users or a user and a guild, uh, things like that. And we have occasion. Uh, we have we don't do so much reading, just for loading users. And sometimes we have bursts, like especially at midnight every day, because there are a lot of features that are daily. So at midnight they reset. So we have like a lot of users connecting at midnight just to like do their daily quest and stuff like that. So like uh, basically the yeah the our uh, RPS like doubles at midnight and um, and something that uh, we are very careful about. All right. Uh, so now I explain how we use CockroachDB. Now uh, Changwon will continue with. Uh, details about how we uh, scaled it and stories about our launch. Yeah, uh, so I am a developer engineer and uh, at, a, at a game developing slash publishing company, and it is basically our team that introduced CockroachDB to our company. So uh, basically, of course, we, we did some studies before we go production, uh, and but I should say I, I, th I think we're one of the one of the guys who learned cockroach uh, the hard way, and I'm gonna talk about the strongest memories I had, which are the three uh, instances, uh, incidents, unfortunately, and how we recovered from each of them. Before I do that, uh, let me uh, just uh, describe how our infrastructure, infrastructure was set up on the day of the launch. Basically, we are 100% on AWS, and most of the applications, our workload is based on Kubernetes. So that means uh, our uh, CockroachDB cluster is also on AWS EKS on EC2 machines. Uh, we also use our uh, custom Helm charts on uh, GitOps, uh, namely Argo CD. And after some like load testing, we, we decided to use like 24 of like uh, those uh, large nodes using a local storage machine. And uh, uh, for the record, this is not how our cluster looks today. Uh, this is how it depicted uh, the, the day of the launch. And uh, we uh, decided to use uh, three AZs without the uh, locality because we wanted to have like this one uh, Helm chart that does everything for our um, cockroach uh, stateful set. But we failed to manage it, uh, managed to like incorporate localities in like this one Helm chart. So we just uh, decided to forget about it, move on. Uh, well, it's the uh, you know it's the AZ failure that you're you're, you're preparing for. So what's what are the odds uh, that was our what, what we thought? Uh, instead, we decided to have a seven replication factor uh, to pre prepare for like the, those usual instance retirement those kind of operations. So uh, can I went back. So uh, this is uh, the day of the launch. Uh, it was uh, January 21st of last year, and we survived the weekend. And that is a big thing for a gaming company because all the users come in, uh, new users come in uh, over the weekend. Uh, however, our, our game went quite viral, as uh, Pierre has said, uh, and we are, the, the rate of increase in our user base did not go down. So it's, it's continuously growing, and uh, also we didn't like, fully consider the side effect of just increasing the replication factor from like, default of three to seven. So as like, all this combined led to a high, a very high disk uh, storage pressure. Uh, so we, we have been monitoring through the weekend, and we got back to work on Monday, and we noticed that we have only 36 hours until we reach a disk full um, event, which is a catastrophic failure, right? So uh, we decided to, well, of course, uh, you would need to scale out at this point, but we decided to create a Blast file first. A Blast file is basically like an empty chunk of file that you can delete when, when the, the disk is full so that you can continue using that, that machine. But we, had a, like an operator uh, mistake uh, that we misconfigured the target directory as slash dev slash file name. Well, it's well, basically team member one. Um, he he went, he was wor working overtime for like over like a few weeks already. So it's, it's just a human mistake that can happen. Uh, this, uh, you, as you can imagine, uh, this led to a serious uh, Linux file system failure. Uh, which uh, by uh, the, the bad side of uh, flipping coins, impacting uh, 16 out of 24 total nodes. And uh, by coincidence, we lost another instance while we are recovering due to EC2 failure. So in the end, we're left, we are only left with uh, seven out of 24 nodes that we set up, initially set up. And that's 
of course, uh, below the majority. That's, that, that doesn't satisfy the, the, the rest quorum, so the cluster is completely destroyed. So the normal course of action uh, at this point would be to restore to a backup, right? But we're, well, we're a company that values our user experience and millions of users have just started to grow affection, like emotional attachment to our games, to the, the like, cookie characters they met along. They were already like decorating their own kingdom. So we, we, we thought we couldn't just uh, turn these uh, user experiences down to zero. So we, we had to find another way. So I, I say uh, it's the unorthodox way because this is, I think it's not the usual cockroach way <laughs> of recovering a, from a disaster. Well, basically, uh, this is one of the three uh, recovery plans that we had, and this is uh, the one that it worked, worked out in the end. We basically uh, reverse engineered the uh, SSD files to analyze what's contained in that uh, S, uh, the file. SSD files are basically the, the, the ex uh, storage extension of uh, the low level uh, storage layer of Cockroach DB. And uh, we worked with uh, Cockroach support engineers to, uh, to have uh, this uh, magical uh, Cockroach debug command that essentially reveals what's uh, contained in uh, these SSD files in a human readable format. And this was only possible because uh, Cockroach had everything open sourced and their document, uh, they, they have like every document about the architecture of uh, Cockroach. So, uh, but the problem now is that we have uh, 7.6 terabytes of these files uh, dispersed all over uh, these uh, seven remaining nodes. So at this scale, uh, Things can only be done in a, using like distributed comp uh, computation, like Spark. So uh, uh, we we uh, also had like a, a data engineering team that is excellent on uh, working with uh, Spark. So uh, we managed to write an SSD file to CSV conversion. We also did some like uh, data de uh, deduplication of like ranges, you know, uh, replicas. We also did some time sort sorting, this kind of pre-processing. And uh, thanks to the fact that the two most important tables were mostly insert only, uh, if it, it meant for us that if all the MVCC data are recovered, then it means we can recover the most recent state of the users. And if you do the math, uh, there's uh, like something like a 3.3% per, uh, chance for a replica to, to, to be gone for good. But well, it's, it's, a, it's a chance to take in, in this kind of situation. So yeah, we moved on. So uh, we managed to uh, obtain the CSV files using uh, this uh, debug command. And we set up a secondary database cluster with, of course, larger scale. And we imported those uh, CSV file to our secondary cluster. And uh, we did some like, data integrity checks based on like user logs, and we had to rewrite server codes to uh, reconstruct those uh, auxiliary tables. And uh, luckily for us, thank God, uh, that 3.3% 3 .3 chance didn't happen on those uh, core tables, so, so they only happened in like uh, you know like system tables and uh, auxiliary tables. So we, in the end, long story short, we, we recovered uh, to. Uh, we recovered 100% of data in like the over 36 hours of outages. So uh, what's the aftermath? What happened after is uh, I think this PR, uh, it's basically taken from a GitHub or uh, the, the GitHub repos repository. It says uh, it's make the last file unable to overwrite existing files and it reads discussed in customer postmortem. I think that's us. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it's me I think it's meant to uh, prevent exactly what happened to us. So, and uh, now in the newer version, uh, they, they, uh, make the, the Cockroach binary makes the last files for you, so you, you don't have to ever, ever worry about this kind of event from ever happening again. Now I'm gonna move on to the second disaster. And uh, uh, this is uh, how I would depict a black swan event. A black swan, a black swan event is where the unthinkable event happens and it breaks everything. And this is obviously a bad looking um, Slack Ops page. Uh, and it basically meant, well, what it meant is that, uh, sorry, uh, six of our uh, database clusters went down because of EC2 failure. It just went down, it wasn't like a, like a termination notice or something. Uh, and this happened because, well, this is taken from the AWS status page on that day and says, 
and there was an increase in ambient temperature within a section of single uh, AZ, which means basically an air conditioning failure. Uh, and what that costed to us is, well, uh, six nodes, nodes out of uh, 60 cluster uh, lost, and um, 34 uh, ranges had only had the, the, the majority within uh, only only that uh, six nodes that were that are gone. So it, this uh, again uh, meant that that data, data integrity has been compromised. And I titled this slide the price of complacency because this would not happen uh, had we configured for locality. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, because, uh, uh, luckily enough, uh, the 32 ranges out of 34 ranges that are gone uh, turned out to be like Hogwarts uh, system ranges. So uh, that, that can be recovered like along the way. Uh, so we tried using uh, this uh, magical uh, debug and save, remove that Rika uh, to recover those uh, two user uh, ranges. Uh, this time it was core table, it was from core tables, but that didn't go well. So we basically did the same thing uh, as in DR number one, and uh, again, we came, came back from the ashes and recovered 100% of data in 20 hours. It, it couldn't go uh, beyond this time because you know, you know, we have to do like a distributed computing spark and all, so we, we couldn't reduce time so much. Well, the good thing is that now it seems that uh, there is a data, uh, there's another debug function they've worked on. Uh, that's, I don't know, it sounds like it's supposed to do what we, we wanted to have uh, back then. Uh, I don't know if it works, I don't want to know. I, I hope I don't get near, anywhere near again. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna talk about, I'll move on to the third disaster, and it's a typical hot range issue. Now it, it sounds typical. <laughs> so uh, we saw uh, a, a DB, a CPU surge in certain nodes after a game update, and uh, which led to occasional probe failures. So uh, coincidentally, again, uh, there was a like hard, hardware issue a few days ago. Uh, so we just thought simply, there was just, uh, similar issues uh, that, that just the bad nodes came back again. So we did the usual operating and we just uh, decommissioned the problem nodes. But an hour later, all nodes became just uh, suspect nodes and the cluster got destroyed. Uh, so in this case, uh, we, we uh, of course uh, turned the service down. Uh, we tried to take the backup, but trying to take the backup kind of exacerbated the situation and all. So uh, that's the point uh, where we kind of noticed that, that this is the uh, hot range issue. Uh, I'm just, just gonna skip everything and uh, discuss why uh, this hot range issue have ever happened. Uh, this is because the primary, uh, we, we had a, like a change in uh, primary key format uh, that uh, haven't been like discussed through. We didn't know like the, the, the impact uh, that uh, this change would bring at that point. So uh, yeah, we decided to just change it and uh, just kind of add up to the cluster overload. And of course, I should also uh, mention that there were users who were eagerly, like they were like impatient about the new feature they, they have been waiting all along and that used a new table which weren't pre-split. Uh, so uh, like, and it like had like frequent raw inserts uh, leading to like uh, this one range that's been like newly created probably. And uh, we also had to swap a node for like an EC2 retirement notice uh, during uh, the maintenance for this new update. And that kind of uh, added up to the replication queue of the cluster. So the cluster was already busy doing things uh, before uh, the service got like op uh, service opened and we, we, we have a hot range issue, something like that, those kind of things. So uh, these are the key nodes that uh, I, I would like to mention. Uh, capacity planning is important, but you, you, have, you have to like, uh, incorporate every aspect of resource, like CPU, memory, and also the storage. Uh, you have to create the blast files, but uh, uh, you, you don't have to worry about uh, if you're using the new, uh, new versions, as I have said. Uh, just uh, set the locality settings. Uh, it's gonna save your career one day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, uh, it kinda, it, it, does, it helps a lot when you're operating things. Uh, like, uh, for instance, if you're trying to upgrade a Kubernetes control plane version or something, you can just take down the entire nodes. Of course, we, haven't, we, we don't take down the entire nodes. We just take down like three, five nodes at the same time that's in the same locality, uh, change the nodes, and then uh, move on. Uh, about uh, hot ranges, uh, Pierre has some uh, more uh, nodes, uh, so I'm gonna pass on back to you. Right. Yeah, I'm gonna finish with uh, a few, few tips and things we learned. Uh, so one thing that, that we found 
a bit later, but that was very useful, is uh, when you create a new table, it starts with one range, and then at, as it gets data, it's the, the range is gonna be split automatically and go uh, to multiple ranges that are gonna be distributed. But when you, when you know in advance that you're gonna have a lot of data coming, which is always the case when we, we release a new feature, you can pre-split those ranges in advance so that it's already distributed even before you get any data. So that's the split add command, uh, highly recommended. Um, another one is, uh, yeah, hot ranges. Uh, they are very easy to, ha to happen. So be really careful when you, uh, with your primary keys, like uh, especially if they are sequential or as he mentioned before, we had an incident where we had perfectly randomized uh, primary keys, but then at some point um, during one release, we added a prefix to it. So they all went to the same range. Uh, so that, that's the one that caused the, the, the third incident he mentioned. So be sure to uh, know how to find, how to detect hot ranges. There are some queries you can run to see, uh, to figure out that you have a hot ranges. I think now in the latest version, the console is also showing you uh, hot ranges. So uh, be sure like, uh, to know how to do that uh, before you go to production. And uh, finally, I think this one was mentioned in already five different talks today, <laughs> the, the as of system time. This is really nice. Uh, when, you, when, you have, uh, when you need to query data and you're writing at the same time on the same tables, or you don't need the latest data, uh, you can use this to uh, get much better performance and prevent contention. This is also useful because um, if you lose data, if you delete data by accident, uh, you can actually recover that data um, during the whole time defined by uh, the GC TTL seconds, which is, I think, uh, 25 hours by default. So we use this a couple times <laughs> in the past. Uh, okay, and then um, to finish, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say a, a story. Like when we had that first uh, disaster uh, incident, the, the very first one, it was uh, five days after we launched our product and it lasted for 36 hours, I think. Uh, very long, sleepless hours for us. But the funny thing is, uh, the users who played during five days before, they got really into the game. So during those 36 hours, they started like posting some memes on the internet, like on Twitter, uh, about them really wanting to play the game and like, please come back. And there was a lot of memes and it became viral so that when we came back online, we had way more users than before, actually. <laughs> so, <that's, laughs> I don't know, like, we will never know how much it contributed to the, the success of the game, but... <laughs> uh, yeah. At the end, maybe... Yeah, it, it helped the game, bad. but I personally don't want to uh, try that again. <laughs> risky, <laughs> risky. Uh, it's uh, definitely not, not a good marketing choice, probably. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you very much uh, for listening to us. If you have any questions, you can grab us uh, later tomorrow. Uh, yeah, thank you. One more question for either of you, because um, you went into all the details about the disaster, which you also are insanely successful. So. Just to reiterate what they said, the game went viral almost upon immediate launch. Um, but what made you initially pick CockroachDB? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK. So uh, we've been using a distributed NoSQL database uh, in our previous games. And uh, that got, uh, the requirements for that game got like uh, complex, uh, so like uh, people wanted to see like the social features like friends or like like exchanging gifts with friends or like guild features where you compete with each other. So you have to uh, write transaction logics, but that's kind of difficult in uh, NoSQL distributed uh, like document-based uh, database. So we've been looking for a database, distributed database that, that supports uh, the SQL uh, transaction Functions. We, we evaluated, it's funny because there was a slide this morning, I think in the Netflix talk about DynamoDB, Aurora, and Cockroach, and right. we had the exact same <laughs> chart in our company, so we did the benchmark with those three, and Cockroach had the better performance. Right. And, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you.